from the North Beach Podcast Company in partnership with TSN. Welcome to episode nine of season two of the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast. Ray, episode nine, we begin with heavy hearts and we record the podcast in tribute to the many terrific broadcasters, colleagues, our good friends who have lost their jobs in the past week plus. Uh, Our industry, like so many others, facing challenges because of the global pandemic, but truly, truly, this has been heart-wrenching um, for all of those who've lost their livelihoods, but for those of us who call these people friends and have worked closely with so many of them over the years. Yeah, yesterday, well, really the last couple of weeks have been um, pretty tough in our industry and in particular yeah. for for TSN, the people that, that of course, we know best. And um, uh, on, on Tuesday, um, you know, there was... Uh, a massive adjustment or layoff, whatever you want to call it, it uh, across the radio network. And in particular for, you know, on a personal note, the, the station in Vancouver, uh, the team 1040, which was, which was shuttered. Um, you know, I, I've worked with some of these people almost on a daily basis for 19 years. And I just, as you say, I just, uh, we feel terrible. It's disheartening and sad. And um, just want to acknowledge so, so many great people um, that that got terrible news yesterday. Yeah. And then not everybody's going to find uh, employment in our industry, but there's so much talent now on the sidelines that I'm confident in saying a lot of those men and women most definitely are going to find their way. It may not feel like it this week because it's so raw, but talent always finds a way to come back into play. Uh, We've got, speaking of talent, we've got Bill Clement, who in our sport, NHL, this is one of the great talents, both on and on off the ice coming up on, on the podcast. And, you know, I, I have a lot of time for Bill, especially now in later stages of his life, as he'll talk about in the interview, which we pre-recorded, you know, he's, he lives with his wife, Sissy in the Blue Ridge mountains. Right. Here's a guy who spent the majority of his adult life in Philadelphia (laughs) and had this dream, this vision, as he'll discuss with us, you know, about moving to the mountains. He wanted to have that great view. I mean, you know, before we started rolling, he's talking about, you know, messing with black bears and cutting trees down and doing all of these things that I would think. When, when I think of Bill Clement and the acting and the hockey playing and the broadcasting, I think of this city slicker from the United States. I don't think of a guy drinking moonshine in the Blue Ridge Mountains. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's quite a twist, quite a turn. Um, but what a storyteller um, has had incredible life experience through playing with the Broad Street Bullies in in the 1970s with the Philadelphia Flyers yeah. and getting into an acting career and then a broadcast career. And I was fortunate enough to work with him in the, for quite a while actually, but in, in particular at the 2006 Olympics in Torino and, um, and with NBC sports when, uh, you know, we, the right. NBC first got the, the national hockey package and um, he's a good man. He's a great storyteller and it is an entertaining uh, 35 minutes. You bet. Uh, we've got a lot to cross in terms of uh, the headlines that have made their way in the NHL this week. I mean, just some some interesting stories, uh, some terrific hockey play as well, uh, and then some boardroom stuff as well. So we'll get to that now. Headlines this week presented by our friends at Legaro.com Jewelers. Valentine's Day is now just days away, right? Days away. You've got the milestone. You've got Valentine's Day. Get online and do your shopping. Well, I got to get going because today's the 10th and um, I've done nothing. (laughs) I bought a card. Don't say anything. You got one. I did. Wow. That's a good effort. I got to get out and even get to that. Well, and you know what my my small item is? You know what my small? I I haven't got to Legaro.com yet, but a small item was was a block of lint milk chocolate. Okay, that's see, what, I'd go get, what I'd go get that for Cammy. I'd go yeah. get that for Cammy Drakes, and Cammy would get a block of chocolate with a portion eaten out of it. <laughs> I can't even go get that until the 13th, or else I'm going to eat it before then. 
if you're driving home, you're staring at it on the the sky. It's like Bart maybe, Simpson. Mm. Maybe just a bite. <laughs> Again, headlines brought to you by our pals, Legaro.com Jewelers. Uh, you're going to get something that you know she or he are going to love. Uh, so do Valentine's Day upright. Remember to use code RATE10 at checkout. And if you do that, you'll get 10% off select regularly priced items. That's Legaro.com Jewelers. The Pittsburgh Penguins are making some big yeah. off-ice news this week. And, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say most of us who followed the league closely weren't even a little bit surprised that Ron Hextall landed as, as general manager. I mean, we'd been following the story closely, knew that he was a, a top candidate. Brian Burke, though, my man, that one mm. came out of left field. And uh, I remember having a conversation with, with Pierre Lebrun on uh, – I guess it was Monday night. Yeah, it was Monday night, about 10 o'clock. And we're sitting there going, geez, here's a weird name that just surfaced, Brian Burke. But, I mean, cone of silence. I mean, it was in the vault with all of our uh, sources associated <clears throat> to the Penguins. So there was inclination that Berkey could be involved, but they kept that one pretty tight under wraps. Are you at all intrigued to see how those two guys are going to be able to work together, Burke and, and Haxey? No, not, I, I mean, I, I, yes, but I'm not thinking that it's a problem. Right. And the reason, the reason I don't is Berkey's 65 years old. He's been through these wars several times and in several times over. Yeah. Um, the, the director of hockey operations has to understand that eventually the decision has to be made by the general manager. Otherwise, you're the general manager. Yeah. And I've known Ron Hextall since we were 19 years old. And Hexy um, would not be taking this job uh, if if Burke if Berkey was pulling the strings and he was just the guy sitting in a suit in the general manager's box. That's right. that's just not Ron's way. And so I I don't think there'll be. I mean, will they have disagreements on players? Of course. Will they? but I don't think their view of what they have to do going forward can be too different. Otherwise the penguins wouldn't have hired two guys right. that are going to butt heads three weeks down the road. That makes no sense. So it, what's interesting is, you know, Hexy, everybody knows him as this fiery player. He's really calm, really methodical, really soft spoken. Berkey's bombastic, bombastic. And he makes all these proclamations and he's got a great command of the language. And if Hexy doesn't have to go talk to the press, he'll be just fine. For he sure. wants to just get to work. And that's that's the Ron Hextall that I know. And the Penguins are getting, and their fan base is getting a, and I'm biased, right? Because because I've known them so long. But they're getting a, a determined, uh, strategic, methodical leader. Yeah. And he he will plug away at the issues that are right down the road. And some of them might not be that easy. But yeah. he's not going to be scurrying around like with a no plan plan. That is not Hexy. Okay, so last week we, we talked about the direction of the Pittsburgh Penguins, right? And I used the word renovation. You quickly jumped in and corrected me and said, no, nah, there's yeah. no such thing. You're not renovating, you're rebuilding. Now, you, you were speaking in general terms. You weren't yeah. solely identifying the Pittsburgh Penguins. But Brian Burke, for me, isn't going into Pittsburgh in any capacity other than wanting to chase another Stanley Cup within the next two to three years. So is that doable with their current roster? And the challenges that you face in trying to improve that roster in COVID-19. It's not like Hexy can pick up the phone unless he's dangling an unbelievable piece. Um, and you can take speculation on that front any direction you want. But how difficult is it going to be to improve that roster to a point where they can be a Stanley Cup contender in the next two, three years? Uh, I think it's really difficult. Um, they don't have a goalie that you would say is a Stanley Cup caliber right. goaltender. Um, their defense is, you know, you, you're, you're going to assume they're going to get healthier at some point, but their defense doesn't look like, you know, you don't have a 30-year-old Chris Latang who can play 27 minutes a game. Remember when they won the Stanley Cup? When they yeah. beat New Jersey, Latang played the entire series. Yes, I know they got great play from Brian Dumoulin and right. um, 
you know, and some underrated players perhaps on that blue line, but Latang played the whole game. They yeah. don't have that anymore. Their, their forward group is thin, thinner than it would have to be. I don't know how you're correcting all of that under the parameter that you just gave. The cap is flat at 81.5 and it's not going anywhere for the next couple of years. <clears throat> and then you've got no draft picks really to speak about to trade for collateral. So I think if, if they feel they can make this run, one of those big, big pieces has to move. Yeah. It has to bring back futures that you can move to make the team better today. Right. The problem is one of those big pieces, of course, we're talking about three guys, is Latang, Malk, and Crosby. The uh, acquiring team, they have to clear that cap space too. Yeah. So you can't trade one of those players for two first rounders and a young prospect and uh, because the other team's got to give you money back. Yeah, Stu. Yeah. And so I, I think that's where the the great challenge lies if they're and clearly they're looking at more immediate than future, but if you're looking immediate, that's the challenge for me. Yeah. Big week in Columbus. Um let's let's start with Miko Koivu, right? Just a terrific NHL player over the span of his career, seven games into the season, uh, and he announces his retirement automatically because of the Patrick Lyon situation, <laughs> which we'll also talk about. You know, you think that, okay, well, Tort's got to him. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how most people think. I, I thought, <clears throat> well, number one, that's not true. Uh, but number two, uh, I thought that it was, it was terrific that Koivu came out very quickly in his retirement speech and said, I just couldn't get to a level of game where I felt like not only could I help my teammates, but I wouldn't be a deterrent to the outcome of the game. I mean, when you feel that way as a veteran player, it's time to call it, right? Regardless if you've started the season or you've ended the season. Well, I'll tell you, I, I say this quite often. There's a point in your career where you feel great, the season ends, you go away, you train in the off season, you come back and you're like, I don't know where my legs are. They're gone. Yeah. Father time has decided that's it for you. Zip, they're gone. I had 76 points when I was 37 years old. I had a great year. Played with Andrew Brunette and Donald Audette. Th you know, 29 goals. I like had a great yes. year. Came back in the off season, trained hard. And a little problem with my knee. Had to get a quick little scope done. Started. I scored my 400th goal, which was my sixth goal of the year in December. Wow. Like all of a sudden it was gone. And then you start asking yourself, you're lying in bed and you're like, can I even do this anymore? Yeah. Because it's not like you walk in with your briefcase into the office. You walk in, you go to practice, you get bounced around. Now you don't feel good. You can't practice well. You can't be on the ice enough. And Koivu would, has had major knee surgery in the last two years. Mm -hmm. You don't just come back from that at 35, 36, 37 years old. And so when he retired, I was surprised, I guess, but really I wasn't. He has a very high standard, like yeah. I guess most players do, but he's got a very high standard. Uh, he had a terrific career, a really workmanlike uh, career, a leader. And I think it kind of speaks to his leadership a little bit that he said, you know what? I just can't do this anymore, and I'm not going to do this half-assed. It's time to go. Yeah, congratulations to Miko Koivu for, as you say, a terrific NHL career. Uh, unfortunately, overshadowed by the bigger story <laughs> in Columbus, and that's the Patrick Lyon benching by John Tortorella on Monday. I mean, we're talking about it nationally, right? I mean, yourself, <laughs> me, Craig Button, James Duffy did a panel talking about uh, Patrick Lyon's benching, uh, and we talked about it on Tuesday. but. More information has surfaced since we did that panel. And, and maybe our position, our views would have changed had we known, you know, what was kind of going on behind the scenes. But good reporting work by Brian Hedger and by Aaron Portsline in Columbus, um, uncovering the fact that there was something, I guess we call it off ice, um, that, that happened here that led to John Tortorella making the decision to bench Patrick Lyon in that game with, 
six something left in the second period. He sat for the remainder of the third. And the allegations suggest that Patrick Lyony made a disrespectful comment to a member of the staff, maybe an assistant coach. I think that's what's being uh, reported. That makes more sense to me now, Ray, because the one thing that I took away from the post game after the benching was John Tortorella emphatically said it was a combination on ice, off ice. And he said, I'm not going to take you into the dressing room, right? So he clearly said, he told us something had happened. We just didn't know what the something was. And now we know that it could have been a quick exchange, but it was something that Patrick Lyon, said to a coach or a member of the staff that John Tortorella didn't like, was disrespectful. Does that make more sense to you now in the bigger picture why John Tortorella would bench this kid just four games into his time with the Columbus Blue Jackets? Well, for sure it does, Drake. Like in that panel, you know, my perspective was four games is too quick yeah. um, to be benching a player. Uh, but Tortorella, and again, this is before we knew any of this other information, Tortorella yeah. would be setting the parameters for what is and is not acceptable in Columbus. It doesn't matter what the parameters were in Winnipeg with Paul Maurice. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that Line a scored 40 goals there. None of that stuff matters. Here you are in Columbus. This is what matters. This is the way we do things. Yeah. So to me, the parameters were being set in that regard, not knowing anything about whatever this exchange was with the coach. And they, they happen, um, right? They're, you know, you're emotional at times on the bench and things get said and whatever it was, they deemed it enough that he needed to sit. Yeah. Now they didn't, they didn't talk on Tuesday apparently because they had an off day. So they'll get to it today, yeah. which is Wednesday. And I'm sure there'll be a discussion and then you go forward. But it's, it was, you know, there was a pretty good onslaught on, on Tortorella who, um, you know, is, is a polarizing guy and someone, you know, to, in full disclosure that we like, Yeah. that, you know, I like John and um, it's funny. You don't get many of his players saying, even after they're gone, you don't get many of them saying, how terribly he treated them. They say he's hard. Yeah. They say he's tough. Um, but um, I, I mean, the way we all, we're all guilty of the quick reaction, the quick, the quick take. And the fact of the matter is there's more to this story. No question. Uh, a developing story is the play of Austin Matthews of the Toronto Maple Leafs and <laughs> a goal scoring prowess. Uh, that is career yeah. best now for him. Um, you know, the Leafs play tonight, but as we record, eight-game goal scoring streak. Eight games. He scored 11 times in 12 games. And I'm no mathematician, but I, I can divide, right? So 294 games played as we record episode nine of season two. 169 goals. Austin Matthews Ray scored in 57.5% of the NHL games that he's yeah. played into this point in his career. Well, uh, the goal he scored against Vancouver uh, in their last game, uh, I think is emblematic of a guy that's, that's just an elite level scorer. And the reason I say that is he didn't play particularly well. He didn't have right. a great night. He got one really great chance and he didn't miss. Yeah. He doesn't need multiple shots to score. He needs the puck. When it's on his stick, it's in a dangerous place for the other team. Uh, the goal scoring is astounding to be eight games in a row is really quite remarkable, right? Like that just doesn't happen unless you're in junior. Um, I've never seen him play this way before, though. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I think he is, Dregs, I think he has played at a level that is greater than at any point um, in his NHL career from you know, there's always this talk and, you know, Mike Babcock said it at one time, I think he can be the best 200 foot player in the game. And now you watch the way he uses his body, the way that he pushes people off the off the puck, he uses his quickness, his speed is, mm -hmm. seems a little, a little quicker. He's, you know, like the goal he scored against Vancouver when he, 
uh, put the puck through Chatfield's stick and skates. I like the reaction and speed of that play look different to me. I, I think he's, he's a legit MVP candidate. And I don't, you know, I know there's people say, oh, you know, Toronto bias and all that bullshit, but um, there's, there's no way you can't look at the way he's playing and say, he has to be in that conversation. Yeah, I agree. Um, Pierre-Luc Dubois was uh, released from exile and quarantine in, <laughs> in Winnipeg a few days ago and um, tough spot for him to be in, right? Like you, yeah. you're doing Zoom workouts and you're riding a bike and you're doing all that stuff before you're allowed to go to the rink and at least practice once with the Jets. Made his debut with the Winnipeg Jets last night. I, I don't know that we should have expected a whole lot. It wouldn't have been fair to expect him to have a dynamic debut with the Winnipeg Jets, but you did that game with, with the crew in Winnipeg. What were your thoughts on his first game? Uh, he looked like he'd been doing zoom workouts and riding a bike for two weeks. Like, how are you going to play? Well, wow. like his, his first shift, I want to say he was out there 20 seconds. Yeah. You know, like he, he's just not even close to banging off the rust yet. Yeah. You know, like he's, uh, I like that Paul Maurice who has a, great take on a lot of things. He said, look, I'm not even really going to watch him very closely tonight. I'm not going to talk to him a lot on the bench. Um, I'm just going to let him play. Mm. And they made, they, you know, they flipped some lines around. They started Trevor Lewis with them. They ended up with Mason Appleton there. Um, uh, Kyle Connor was on the left side. That's not where he's going to play, but they're not going to play him in a position where he doesn't know the system. He doesn't know. Right. Oh, I remember getting traded and Dubois would be the same even though you've played against these guys, you don't even know their names. No, you're on the ice. Like lots of times you're on the ice. You look at a player and you just know who it is by the way they're skating. Like, you know who you're on the ice with. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while you get on the ice with somebody you're not familiar with and you go, Oh, what the hell is he doing out here? Or maybe they're saying that about me, but Dubois wouldn't have any of that. Everybody would have looked like a stranger to him last night. And they got the first one out of the way. And you know, Calgary with a, a late goal wins in a really good hockey game. And so they play their four game set. Winnipeg got five points. Calgary got four points. Yeah. And, you know, and both Dubois and those teams move on. All right. We're going to wrap up headlines. Um, and I, this is a bit of a curveball for you, but talking about the Vancouver Canucks. And I, you know, there's so much heat on Jim Benning, maybe Travis to some degree. I, I, I don't buy into the lame duck theory because he's in the final year of his coaching contract. I, I never have put a whole lot of stock in that. You can, you can debate that because I'm sure you've been in rooms where the coach was in the final year of his contract. But I'm wondering, why don't we pay more attention to the schedule? You know, the fact that this new team, relatively young, has had, what, maybe three, four practices since right. the start of the year. Um, they played 16 games in 26 days, which is way more than, you know, other NHL teams. No training camp or a very short training camp. And guys are just dead tired. That's the way it looked to me of late. Mm -hmm. But yet we collectively in the media, you know, well, it's Benning's fault. Or, you know, Travis, he's, you know, they've tuned him out or any of that stuff. I, I I guess I'm I'm not trying to be critical of my colleagues, but I'll ask it this way. Are we overlooking the obvious? And the obvious being that they've got a ridiculous schedule that they've just come through. And Travis and the coaching staff haven't had the opportunity that they'd normally have to work with what is a relatively new group. Yeah, the the reason we we overlook it is because it's the dull story. It feels like an excuse. It yeah. you're like, well, you got the games, play the games, win the games. Yeah. The fact is they are run into the ground, but there's also a fact that it's not a it's not a team that's constructed very well. There are obvious holes there. And I think that's where the the heat flies towards Benning. He's in his seventh year. Yeah. And all of a sudden you got four draft picks from your seven years playing on your team. Um it's top heavy. Those top guys have to play well. And, and by not being a well-constructed team, you have to play them so much that there's probably diminishing returns. 
And so I, I think that's why the practice stuff gets pushed to the back, but it is a factor. There's no question it is a factor. They are, they're wiped out, they're tired, and they need to practice. That can help them and should help them, but they're in a, they're in a tough spot now. I'm going to say one thing, though. Uh, we touched on it at the start here about the, the day our business had yesterday. Yeah. Uh, with you know, in, in particular, you know, from my experience, the Vancouver radio station that was was closed. Uh, Travis Green reached out to a number of members of the Vancouver media yesterday uh, to offer his thoughts and say thank you for you know for their work and their interactions. And by the way, the Vancouver market is not an easy one. It's no. not like they were all saying, "Hey, Travis, you're the best coach all the time." No. I thought it showed a lot uh, of empathy and consideration for Travis to do that. No question. Headlines this week, as always, brought to you by Legaro.com Jewelers. Our interview today with Bill Clement is brought to you by our pals at CoolBet.co. Chris from CoolBet will join us in a bit uh, to recap Super Bowl Fifty Five and also talk about NHL odds and some other things. He. He, he, he's, he's got a segment on curling that I think is going to surprise a few people. So Chris from CoolBet will join us. Uh, you must be 19, and CoolBet reminds you, stay cool. Always bet for responsible. All right, our next guest is longtime NHL analyst, former NHL player, and perhaps most importantly, the shirtless spokesman for Deep Woods Off Mosquito Repellent. You know him, you love him, Bill Clement. Bill, thanks for joining us today on the Rain Dregs podcast. How are things in North Carolina? Well, you just can't beat the deet in Deep Woods <laughs> Off. <laughs> and, and I know, and, and, and I know this, at times of the season, I need my deep woods off here in the mountains of North Carolina, but it's a short mosquito season, so it's not too bad. How many years ago was that? So I'm Googling this morning, of course. That's what we have to do now, right? And, and yeah. I mean, you're still an attractive man. I'm comfortable enough in my own masculinity to say that, but, you know, shirtless at that time was, that was aggressive. That was putting yourself out there. How many years ago were we talking here? Well, just for the record, um, the, the, I shot the first one in 1987, and I had to fly to Florida and shoot it overnight in the Everglades between a Tuesday and Thursday ESPN game. The Rangers and the Flyers were in the playoffs, and I, I landed the job. I auditioned in New York, and I had to fly to, to Florida to do it, so it was a real tough turnaround, right? Game in Philly on Tuesday night, shooting in the Everglades all night on Wednesday night, and a game in New York on Thursday night, kind of like a typical, you know, playoff schedule. You guys can relate to that. So that was 1987. There were 10,000 mosquitoes in the tent. I had a pair of shorts on and a pair of boots, and that was it. And they reshot it in 2003. And this time, they put uh, 40,000 mosquitoes and biting flies. The repellent had, had, it had developed to such a degree that I was safe no matter which way I went. And I, I jokingly tell people um, that I was in the tent with people said, are you really going to get in a tent with all those mosquitoes and biting flies with just a pair of shorts on? And my answer was always the same for the amount of money they paid me. I would have gotten in naked, <laughs> naked. <laughs> now, when you went and scooted to do the commercial bill, did did you tell anybody or was that one of those ones where you just went dodged out, dodged back? No, I actually talked it over with the late Bruce Connell, oh, yeah. uh, who tragically passed away a few years ago. He was our producer and he said, you got to do what you got to do, man. It's a big hit. I mean, I was a full-time actor at that time and it just started with ESPN pretty well, 86, 87. Um, and the broadcasting thing started to started to take more and more of my time, but I still was able to make this one audition. And I ended up, I'm glad I did over a period of about seven years, I just kept getting checks and I ended up making about $180,000 for that one day in oh, Florida. Florida. <laughs> yeah. The checks just kept coming and I would go, boy, I love this world. Whoa. Well, <laughs> what a country. A this a is awesome. For, a dollar for every mosquito bite. Is that what it was? <laughs> yeah. Something like, you know what they wanted me to, um, 
they said to me when I arrived and met everybody in Florida, they said, you know, we're going to ask you to sign an affidavit when you're done saying that you didn't get bit by anything. And I said, give that to me now. And I signed it in the afternoon. Right. And that night in the Everglades, I got bit twice. They put mosquitoes and biting flies, you know, like cow flies that then take a chunk out of you. And one got me right here. And one of my moves was getting up and down off this cot and grabbing this buzzing box full of mosquitoes and shaking it. And I wiped the repellent off the back of my leg. So one bit me on the back of my leg. So I got bit twice in both of those sessions. That was it. And uh, I'm glad I signed the affidavit before I, you know, before I shot. You're an honest man. You're an honest man. How do no, you, no, how no. Do you... I'm, I'm devious. That's why I wanted to sign it before the shoot. <laughs> Billy, how did you get from, um, or how, what road took you from a player to an actor? Personal and corporate bankruptcy, actually. Um, I got into the restaurant franchising business. Grandma Lee's Bakery and Delis in Canada were looking to expand to the U.S., and my retirement kind of took me by surprise. I walked in and sat down across from Cliff Fletcher and Cliff was our GM in Calgary. And he made all kinds of changes to our roster that summer. And I, I talked to him every two weeks, you know, Cliff, where am I in all of this? You know, y'all, you're fine. You're fine. And Bob Johnson was coming in to coach the flame. So uh, Al McNeil was gone finally. And I was, I, mean, I had a party when I found out that Al McNeil had gotten fired and Bob Johnson was coming in and I was, so I was in the best shape of my life. So I walked in two weeks before camp and sat down with Cliff Fletcher. And jokingly, I said, because Cliff, you know, didn't make conversation all that easily and, and wasn't social butterfly. But I said, so Cliff, am I still part of the organization? And he looked back at me across his desk and said, no, you're not. We're phasing you out. Oh, is how he put it. And I went, you're what? He said, we're phasing you out. And I could have gone, I had one year left on my deal. I could have gone to Hartford or New Jersey to finish that last year. They were interested. But then I thought, maybe I won't get a deal after that. I had played my 11 years in the NHL. I was 31. Um, and I thought, wow, if I retire, what am I going to do? So I acquired the rights for Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama for Grandma Lee's Bakery and Deli. And the plan was going to be to open up a pilot store in Atlanta and sell franchises based on the great success of the pilot store and then eventually sort of gallop off into the restaurant franchising sunset. Um, it didn't quite work that way. Atlanta, I hadn't, I had not done enough research to realize that Atlanta had more food and beverage establishments per capita than any city in North America. And everybody was looking to open up location number two, three, four, or five, and I'm coming in, no restaurant experience, no knowledge of this franchise in Atlanta, but I, I finally opened up a store and uh, I did it with a lot of friends' money, investors' money. I had a limited partnership. And after a year and a half, I ended up closing the doors. And I can honestly say that it was the, the darkest time in my life because I fell into these, these, these gorges of depression. And the hardest phone calls I've ever had to make were the phone calls to investors who I, I knew them all telling them that their money was gone. And not only was their money gone, but all of my money was gone. So I thought, what in the world am I going to do now? And I'd actually realized when I had five real estate agents looking for the right location that I'd gone a year without a paycheck. And that didn't, I went, my God, I haven't had a paycheck in a year. That didn't sit well with me. I grew up in a family that worked really hard. You know, we, we put bread on the table and all that stuff. And I thought, well, what can I do that might be financially rewarding that I might have an aptitude for that isn't all that time consuming? And I thought, you know what? I think I can do commercials. I see some of these guys on TV. I'm, I'm going to try it. But Atlanta was really competitive. And their agents, like New York agents, you had to sort of slide your picture under the door. But I had an in, Kurt Bennett, who I played with, the, the famous Bennett brothers. There were five of them that played. Harvey played. Billy played. Well, Kurt's wife, Susan Bennett, who interestingly enough, about 10 years ago, I was reading an article in USA Today, was the voice of Siri. And oh, Susan was on. an entertainer and an actress. And she got me a go-see with two agents in Atlanta. And I said, they said, we'll get a headshot done and we'll send you out on some auditions. So I'd actually landed a couple of decent commercials um, while I was waiting for the restaurant to open. So that was all I knew when the restaurant closed. 
And I decided to take it to as high a level as I could. And I started, I enrolled in every acting class I could get in the Alliance Theater School in Atlanta and, and got pretty good at it and ended up moving to New York and doing pretty well there. And the phone rang one day and it was ESPN saying, would you like to audition for a job as color analyst? And I'm here to tell you that when you have to audition for your lunch and your rent every week, every month, every quarter, it's hard. It's, it's, that's pressure to me. And I thought a regular paycheck sounded pretty good. So I said, well, what does the audition consist of? And they said, live game on the air. So myself and four other guys, I think JD was one of them, John Davidson, I, they gave me a game in Chicago, uh, Minnesota North Star, Chicago Blackhawks. And, and I won the audition and my broadcast career was launched. But that, that in-between part going from hockey to acting, there's a, there's a, a real important part of my life because I, I wouldn't have been as successful as I ended up being without that complete ruin. I, I really believe that. Oh, I learned so much and it was so hard, but it, it gave me the, the strength and I think a little bit of the, the calluses and the, I don't know, the, the determination to make it back. But it was hard. Bill, we'll, we'll get a little later uh, into this a little later on where, where we started, you know, where I got to work with you. But one thing that um, I noticed as we worked, and I'm just listening to you tell that story, is that you always had a, okay, this is our, this is what we have to do. This is how we have to figure it out. Okay, we don't have this answer. Let's find this answer. Was that born out of your hockey career or was that born out of that time? I think I, I think we're all products of our histories. And I, I think I'm, I'm a product of my mom and dad. And there were issues in our upbringing and family. And I always saw my dad uh, problem solve and, and have a plan and no matter what I've done in my life, I find myself saying, okay, wait a minute, I don't feel right until I have some of the, I need some foundation here for what's going on. And um, I think that's just something that I learned from my, my parents, how to, uh, how to problem solve, um, how to navigate, you know, certain situations that might not be all that enjoyable to navigate. Um, and it, it's funny, that game that I did for ESPN, the audition, the first thing I needed to know from them, because I hadn't done TV, I did a couple of games with Doc Emmerich when he was subbing, uh, doing some Devils games way back then in the mid 80s. And the first thing I asked the guys at ESPN, Scotty Connell, who was Bruce's dad, and he hired me, I said, who do you want me to be? Like, what, what do you what do you expect from your mm -hmm. analyst for a hockey game? And he said, this is simple. He said, we want you to educate the uneducated without offending the educated. So in other words, you couldn't dumb it down, had to communicate certain things about the game almost in disguise so that novice hockey fans could understand it. But people that watched hockey all the time didn't think that I was talking down to them. And then, you know, people say, you always have, you have a plan for everything, don't you? I said, yeah, I, I don't feel right if I don't have a, a plan. You know, for how's this going to go? What are we going to do? What do you want? What's expected? And, and I drive people crazy with it, as you know, from having worked with me. <laughs> always a pad. Always a pad. Always. Oh, yeah. Always. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You had that um, advice. I'm sitting on the set at ESPN one night doing the NHL tonight with Butchie. And uh, I get a, a, somebody comes down and says, uh, yeah, we need you in Dallas to do a game tomorrow. And I said, well, I've never. I don't even know what to do. Bill, I Drake's, I felt sweat pouring out of my arms from my elbows to my ribs as I sat there. So the only guy I really had a number for at that time was Darren Pang. So I called Panger. I'm like, hey, Panger, what do I do? He's like, oh, Parm, it'll be easy. You know, Panger, right? He's like, oh, it'll be easy. He swirled his glass probably like this. And he's like, you get a couple of notes on all the guys. And then, and, you know, and he's just going on and on and on. And I'm like, okay. So I go to work with the late, great Dave Strader. And Strait says, what do you want to do in the open? And I said, uh, I, I don't know. What's the open? I have, what's an open? <laughs> no idea. No idea. So my, my advice came from Panger, yours from, from the Connells. And probably you were probably a little, little ahead of the game at the time. Yeah. Well, so speaking of sweat, you mentioned sweat, right? You start to sweat. In 1987, the the U.S. Olympic team, the national team, played two games against traveling Russian all-stars. 
And it was televised by somebody packaged it. And I don't even know what network is on, but <clears throat> I got to work a game with Al Michaels. Oh. And it was like, wow. And Al had not worked and called a game since the, the, the gold medal game, the miracle on ice in 1980. So Al says to me, look, be as active as you want. Jump in all the time, you know, go ahead and do your thing. I said, fine. So the night before the game, Bruce Connell was our producer. He came to me and he said, look, Mike Ruzioni was supposed to be our host and he was going to do all of the interviews between periods, all that stuff, right? Down in one of the locker rooms. But he said he's, he, he got a better offer, so he's not coming. <laughs> Can you run down, you know, Mikey, Mike Ruzioni, America's guest. Oh, wait a minute. I got a better offer. I can't make it. So he said, can you run down and do the interviews? I was scared to death to do interviews. I'm, I'm brand new in the booth. Right. But you know, I'm just idiot, idiot, you know, sure. I can do it. No problem. So I, I got an interview. We picked uh Jill Boisvert and uh, Tony Granado. Uh, it was the, uh, yeah, it was the U.S. Olympic team that was going to play. So say, I, totally I got my questions in my head, right? The whole first period, I hardly said three words. Poor Al Michaels. I'm thinking about the interviews. How do I get into them? How do I get out of them, right? So I'm going to start with Tony Granado. Hey, this is where we're with uh, Tony Granado. Um, what's a kid from Downers Grove, Illinois, doing in the Olympic program? That doesn't seem like it's a hotbed of hockey. So I'm down there. I sit down and run and go. Here with Tony Granado. Tony, what's a kid from, what's a kid from, uh, well, I'm dying on television, Tony. Why don't you tell me where you're from? And, and he says, from Downers Grove. So I get started, and now I'm completely panicked. I, I somehow get through the interview. Now it's time for highlights. I didn't know the difference between having one tape machine and two tape machines, right? Two tape machines, you cross roll. You show the one highlight, the other one's ready to go. You go right into the second highlight. They're queuing up the other highlight, third highlight on the first tape machine. We had one tape machine. Oh, so I'm no. looking down. I call the first highlight and Bruce, is, Bruce says to me, look up, look up. Well, I knew there were two more highlights to come. So I don't know what look up. So I look up and I'm right, trying to get through it. And he says, okay, second replay. I look down and I'm thinking, Oh my God, is this going to happen again? And he yells, look up, look up, look up. So I got to look up and fill for another 20 seconds, right? Now, by this time, sweat is dripping off. my It's literally dripping off my nose. I look like Albert Brooks in broadcast news. Right. And, and Bruce, we had a female stage manager, and Bruce is yelling, and he doesn't realize he's got my key pressed down with hers. So he's yelling at her. Get a towel and wipe him off. He looks effing terrible. But he didn't say effing. He, he's, he's screaming, he looks terrible. Get a towel and wipe him off. And I'm just trying to survive to get out of this locker room and get back upstairs. And I had to go down and do it again in the second intermission. I called my wife after that game and said, I think my broadcast career just ended tonight. <laughs> oh, my God. So when you mentioned having sweat drip off your nose, petrified. Oh, my God. Darren, you ever... You, Darren, you seem like you, you were born just to sit there and schmooze and nothing would ever rattle you. You ever have any of those uh, crossroads moments? Oh, yeah. Uh, one that comes to mind instantly was, was when TSN hosted the draft. Ray, I don't know if you were there for this, um, but I'm on the floor. James Duffy is hosting from the set. Gordon Miller, Bob McKenzie, the group are up on stage. And so they're throwing to me first. Dutty is coming to me to set the scene. Here's 17 trades that are likely going to happen. Well, as he's introing the show and is about to throw to me, I mean, Billy, we haven't been around each other a whole lot in the broadcast world. I clear my throat and cough a thousand times during a game. That's just my nervous thing. So I can feel my throat starting to get twitchy and itch a little bit as he's throwing to me. So he throws to me and uh, to set the scene on some of the bigger deals that we expect to happen, let's go down to the floor with uh, Darren Dreger. Dregs, I'm like, yeah, James, come on, Dad, please. And, he, and I, I, I can't talk. I got to stop. And I clear, and I can't clear my throat. So I try again, and I'm like, well, and so he, <laughs> 
he cuts in, thankfully, who's ever producing, I don't know, it was Billy Dodson or Mark Miller on the truck or whatever, just say, um, you know, James, you have to take it. So James comes back, he says, well, obviously Darren is experiencing some technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bad one. That, was, oh, that was as bad as it gets for me. But hey, oh, Billy, so long before you're a broadcaster and an actor, you're a character with <laughs> one of the most fearsome teams of all time. Yeah. Uh, the, the broad street bullies of the early seventies basically took the game of hockey and dumped it on its ear and yeah. said, we are going to chase people around and scare the living daylights out of them while having a bunch of good players. Yeah. Could you see that happening as it was going or did, did it just all of a sudden become the broad street bullies? Um, I, it really started to, to, to take a, a true shape when Schultze arrived, when Dave Schultz came to the team. Schultze and I turned pro together in 1970, played a year in Quebec. Then we both started the next season with Don Seleski um, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, because the Quebec Aces moved to Richmond and became the Richmond Robins. And I got called up first. And then later that season, Schultze got called up and by that time, Schultz was the terror of the of the American Hockey League. Um, he was the baddest, the toughest, all of those things, and uh, he soon became that in the NHL. So, with with Bob the Hound Kelly, who was a third round pick the year I was drafted as a second round pick, Kelly made it right away out of junior because he said to Keith Allen, a general manager, he said, "I ain't going to Quebec City." <laughs> he said, "Well, you better have a damn good training camp then if you don't <laughs> plan on going to Quebec City." And the Hound replaced a, a guy named Earl Heskela, who was the tough guy for the Flyers. And the Hound was pretty tough. Uh, later that season, when Schultz was already there, we got Moose DuPont, um, who was a, a rock. I mean, Moose was a, he played hard. We had guys that were really dirty players, like Eddie Van Imp and, and Clarkie, that, that would use their sticks to intimidate. Um, I would a little side note here. I had players that we played against over the years say, you know, one thing I didn't respect about Bobby Clark was he always asked other guys to do his fighting for him. And what they didn't understand is that that wasn't true. The players that, that fought for Clark, he just did it instinctively. He was, I, I can't imagine that there has ever been anybody that's been, that's a better leader than Bobby Clark was led by example. He was tough. He would have fought to the death but he was so revered as a leader that all of our tough guys jumped in to protect him all the time. And years later, I was st studying a bit of the Civil War, and uh, I, I read an article about how when Robert E. Lee, leading the Confederate Army, just tried to lead his troops into battle, his men would stand around his horse, and uh, the infantryman on foot would turn his horse around and escort him to the back of the lines to protect him, to keep him there. And that's basically the way it was with, with the guys fighting for Bobby Clark all the time. Um, so the one thing we did was we stuck together. And I wasn't a fighter. I had to have my one fight a year to let anybody know that I was willing to do it, right? That's it. And you always wanted an uneven number in your PIMS. Like, you know, if you, you, know, you wanted to have 27 penalty minutes so that somebody would at least know there was a five in there. And if you had two fights, well, shit, now I got to have a third fight so that my PIMS end in an uneven number. Damn. But um, so for, for guys that, that, you know, that didn't fight a lot like me, you, you were in the shit one way or the other. I mean, it didn't matter. The benches emptied all the time. And it was like a street fight with only three cops and 20 different fights going on. So it was, um, it was, it was pretty powerful to be able to intimidate a lot of teams, but it was also intimidating. Like you were in it all the time. It was edgy. Like Brian Engblom had the best line about what it was like playing in the spectrum. He said, we'd pull in in our bus with the Montreal Canadians, pull down under the spectrum. The big door would come down behind the bus. So now we're in the spectrum. The bus driver would turn off the bus and it would still be shaking. <laughs> so, <laughs> Bill, now you guys used to walk out of your locker room right down those steps to your bench and onto the ice. Yes. We came out of our locker room in the visitors, and now I played after you, but the remnants of Dave Brown and Ben Wilson and Craig Berube were still around there. 
And yep. you had to turn left and walk down that curved walkway and come out the Zamboni door. And we'd always want, there'd always be some smart ass that would say, hey, make sure you grab so-and-so so he doesn't drop off into one of the locker rooms here. We were yeah. all scared we were going to lose guys on the way down there. It was <laughs> terrifying. And that all started from what you guys, Yeah, that spectrum became the most scary place to play by far in the yeah. NHL. It was scary when I had to go back and play. Because when I got traded away, it's like, because I played the second year of the Washington Capitals. We were not only a horrible hockey team, we had nobody. I had, We'd get beaten nine to two and we'd just get bludgeoned on the ice. I mean, everybody was tougher than we were. I remember going to our coach and GM, Mill Schmidt, was a, what a wonderful man he was. And I, I walked into him after a game. I just took my, my sweater off and with my skates on, I walked into his office. I said, Milt, I don't know if you notice what we're noticing, but we're getting the shit beat out of us out there. He said, I know, I know. We're, we're close to getting Jack McElhargy from the Flyers. And I said, well, you know, sooner is better than later, Milt, because we're not only getting killed on the scoreboard, but look, look at our guys. You know, like a mash unit. Guys are getting a fight and just getting killed and hammered. But I will tell you something. You talked about coming out of your visitor's locker room in the spectrum and taking a left and going down around and coming on the Zamboni. That The visiting team used to come straight down the chute like the Flyers do and did at the time. But because there were brawls in the hallway up well, of there. Course. Who thought Cashman, that was a good Paul idea, Holgren, What's that? Who would have thought that was a good idea? Let's send them all right out together. <laughs> well, it was a good idea until two or three brawls happened in the, on the on the concrete up in the hallway between uh, Paul Holmgren and Wayne Cashman. They ended up putting a, a fence up in between, and then they thought, no, let's just reroute them the other way. So that was why you had to go on the Zamboni entrance door. Oh, so that was an improvement. It was supposed to be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> in theory. <laughs> hey, so in your in your career what aside from the the cops would you say was like a uh a takeaway highlight because i i think i probably know more of your highlights you worked in five olympics as a broadcaster you worked stanley cup championships but as a player like what like i have a couple of takeaways from mine what what would be for you i think one of the the greatest team takeaway and <clears throat> I only missed the playoffs once in my 11 years in the NHL. And that was the very first year that I got called up in Philadelphia. Wow. But boy, in Atlanta, we had good teams and we couldn't even win a game. And those best of threes, you know, the first round was a best of three. Um, and we lost twice to Los Angeles, once to Detroit, once to Toronto when Roger Nielsen was coaching the Leafs. So we couldn't get any traction. But when we went to Calgary, we had a good team when we got there. We only lost our first year in Calgary. It was 80-81. We lost five home games is all playing in the old corral. And it, we had a big, strong, tough team as well. Willie Plett, Harold Filipoff, you know, there we had some tough guys. And I think my, my greatest thrill as a player was going into Philadelphia as a member of the Calgary Flames and having to play a game seven after we lost game six in the playoffs on home ice, we had them. Uh, we had them three games to one. We go to Philly and uh, we lost game five. We go back to Calgary and we lose game six. Now it's three three, and nobody wins a game seven in the spectrum, right? You you knew that. I I knew that. It was the quietest I've ever heard any locker room. We just sat there and we were prepared, and we went out and we just played hard. And we won four to one and it could have been nine one. And the look on the faces of guys like Ken Linsman, who I couldn't stand uh, as a player, the rat. And uh, who could? Who could? Yeah. His look on his face was a, a look of disorientation. Like he was in this, he was trapped and he didn't know how to get out of it because they, they couldn't find their game. Mm -hmm. And I heard later from players that we knew some like Paul Holmgren said on our flight back, guys were partying, hooting, hollering, like it's just going to throw the sticks on the ice. But going into Philadelphia in 1981, and that propelled us to the conference finals, we ended up losing to Minnesota, and Minnesota was bound to lose to the New York Islanders because that was in the Islanders' uh, you know, dominant days. But winning a game seven on Spectrum Ice as a team was a, was a huge thrill 
for me because I knew how hard it was. Yeah. Bill, we're, you know, I, I'm thinking through all this time and I, I, I'm thinking about when, you know, people see things on TV and they don't really know where they come from. Right. And you and I, uh, along with my wife, Cami, worked at the Olympics in Torino uh, in 2006. So here we are, we're putting on, we're the studio show for the games, uh, for all the hockey, and uh, we're at their main arena in Torino. But there's two arenas. And we are so far underneath the arena in Torino, in this concrete bunker. box bunker. At one point, I don't know if you remember this, but you said to me, you go, we're going to watch some Olympic hockey. And so we went upstairs, we unhooked all our mics and we went upstairs. We watched, I don't know, three minutes of Olympic hockey live. We didn't even know what building the games were in. We were so far underground. Yep. We couldn't hear them. You couldn't, couldn't hear, hear a thing. Nothing. Right? Cheering, no whistles, no nothing. But what I, what I want to make sure that I say is that in those, in those two and a half weeks, we put out uh, an incredible amount of content, but you were so helpful to, to me doing my first event like that to Cami, who should have been on that team, but was rather ridiculously released. Left off, yeah. And so she didn't know anything about television. Like she'd never been on before. And you were so helpful. And it just can't, it comes easy for you. It, you know, the, the leadership thing. I know you're, you motivational speak and um, it comes easy for you, but you're so, so good at it. And oh, I think thanks. people listening today are going to get, probably have a better idea of what you were able to bring to broadcasting and with your passion and your knowledge and your ability to communicate. It's, it, it's been really instructive for me. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough for saying that. Those are kind words. I, my, my, my dad, I really believe wanted to be the guy, the only, the only guy with a ladder in our neighborhood so that he could help everybody. And my mom was like that too. She just wanted to, to help people. And so I grew up with two people modeling for me, uh, on, on how to help others. So that, that part comes naturally, but I, I have to tell you this, Cammy was a rookie and she, she she's a, a star. She just gave it everything she had. All I had, all I would have to do was plant an idea, like go, go with it. Tell us about this. And away she would go. But, but you and I had the majority of time to kill and fill. There were no produced elements. We would end up doing an hour and a half trying to drag people in from the hallway to interview them, do anything, right? So day after day after day, we were creating from nothing, creating something from nothing. And, and I wrote about this in my book, and I, th I, don't, I don't even ever think I got you a copy of it. I mentioned it because I wanted you to see it because I said, you wouldn't believe Ray Ferraro. If, if you think I help you, trust me when I tell you, you help me more than I help you because no matter what I threw at you, you would turn it into something substantive. It would be something meaty, something that would be opinion. It would be uh, something that nobody had thought of. It would be a fresh new information, you know, something original, which is what we all try to do, right? Have an original thought, have an original angle or slant. And, and you would go for, you know, you'd go for a minute, 45 seconds, and it would be great. And that would give me a chance to try to load up again to help you. So believe me, it was symbiotic. I mean, if you think uh -huh. I was helping you, you were helping me as much as, so it, it, it worked. And, and that was, I look back at that as being in the trenches, being in that dungeon, being in the bunker. The coolest it got was about 96 degrees Fahrenheit, <laughs> right? Remember how we sweated? You, you Oh my God. Oh. Do, you remember, I, do you remember the tough uh, Italian security? When we'd come no. in through the back door, there are two guys sitting at the back. They'd be in their chair leaning back like this. Oh, After yeah. The third day, they didn't even look at our passes. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just right. If you're going down there, go ahead. And move yeah. On. Oh, geez. <laughs> so no, how's it was... in North Carolina, Bill? Tell yeah. me before we wrap up, how's life in North Carolina? Um, yeah. What brought you there? And 
I, I read you're you're always with a chainsaw and you've always uh, you're always improving the view. Yeah, I love the outdoors. I love working in the woods and the bush. And uh, we we wanted to, you know, I mean, I knew I was going to retire at some point. We lived in the Philadelphia area in Bucks County, PA, which was great. Have wonderful friends there. I wanted to live someplace where I had an incredible view. I've always I always said to my wife, Sissy, and it's funny, we, we were, my marriage fell apart when I filed my corporate and personal bankruptcy. But as when I started acting, I was paired up to read uh, with an actress named Sissy Callahan. Um, as husband and wife, we were paired up to read on a National Blue Cross Blue Shield commercial audition. And that was 35 years ago. And we've been married for almost 35 years. Awesome. Um, but we started talking about retirement. And I always said to Sissy, I said, look, if I'm ever incapacitated, uh, you know, I have a stroke or whatever, and I can't talk. All I would ask is that you take me someplace where I can see far. I just, there's such a peace for me when I can look off into the distance that doesn't seem to end. And uh, I said, well, I haven't had the stroke yet. And I can still see. So let's go now where we can see far. And we have an incredible view. We're 4,000 feet up on the side of a mountain. It's a gated community, but there are only 17 homes, uh, 30 homes in the community, and it's massive. Um, don't even know we have neighbors. And uh, friends of ours one day said, we're going to Asheville, North Carolina. Why don't you come with us? We're thinking of retiring there. That's how it started. And over a period of three years, we kept coming back, looking, you know, finding the little town that we wanted to live outside of. We wanted the amenities. We wanted a view. The cost of living is great. The people are friendly. The pace is slower which I like, I find myself walking slower. And, you know, in our world, guys, it's always deadlines, got to go, got to go, got to go. Right. So it was just, it was just time. I got, I really got tired of getting on and off airplanes for business to go to work. Yeah. How's the moonshine? Oh, I have to have a jar of shine in my fridge right now, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, like a guy, two guys have brought me jars of moonshine. One guy has a farm right beside us and I helped him. He had a, a Buckeye nuts. I don't know if we are the Ohio State Buckeyes are named after the Buckeye tree. The nuts are beautiful, but they're poisonous. So he lost a couple of cows and I helped him. We were trying to, you know, we were trying to help the cows survive over there. And as, and it was, it was hard work A 1500 pound heifer. He, he lost in the field, the Buckeye nuts, if they eat them are poison. And they just, they do all kinds of crazy things. So anyway, as a, as a thank you, he brought me a, a jar of shine. And then guys that were painting my house last week, he said, well, you like a jar of shine? I said, you can get shine? Oh yeah, you get all the shine you need, boy. <laughs> so so I, have a, I have a nice jar of shine in the, in the fridge right now. It's a real uh, thing down here. Now, how uh, do you drink shine? Do you, I assume you sip it. Well, I t yeah, you sip it. Uh, depending on how thirsty you are, you can take a kind of a, a gulp of it if you want. And the effect is almost immediate. I will tell you that. It's like 180 proof. Oh, boy. So do you get so, in the face if you mix? Like if you, if you were to put a Diet Coke in a couple of ounces of moonshine, are you getting throat punched? Are you getting what? Throat punched. That's a segment we have here on the podcast. Oh. <laughs> are you are you offending somebody if you mix the shine? Oh yes, yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> you did you say are you getting throat punched? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! You know who throat punched me in a training camp? I couldn't talk for five minutes, and our trainer was laughing his ass off at me. Dave Hansen, Killer Hansen. I had no idea who he was. I dropped the gloves with him in the corner in Atlanta because he was acting like an idiot. And he hit me so hard behind my ear that I was sore for two years. The next shift, I was blowing around him, and he had reached out with one hand and punched me right in the throat. And I couldn't breathe. And Norm Mackey was our trainer. I get to the bench, and first, first thing he said after my fight, he said, what are you doing fighting Killer Hansen? I said, who? He said, that's Killer Hansen. I said, well, were you going to tell me that was Killer Hansen? I didn't want to fight Killer Hansen. <laughs> and, and then after he punched me, every time I was on the ice in that, sh that scrimmage against K Dave Hansen, I'd look over at Norm Mackey and he'd be going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. That's the throat punch promo of all time, Ray. <laughs> that, that is it. We're going to let you go, Billy. And I'm just going to say this because I need to. One of my favorite all-time commercials, Clement, Clement, Hands of Cement. 
<laughs> there they are, boys. They're all gnarly and bent and arthritic now, but yeah, they're still hands of cement. <laughs> Thank you, boys. Thanks, Billy. It was fantastic, fantastic to see you. Well. you. Fantastic okay, guys, see, see you soon. You. Thank you, eh? Yep. I mean, Ray, there's so many different reasons to enjoy spending time with Bill Clement. And, and you've spent a ton of time, as we talked about in the interview with Billy. Uh, but, man, he ticks a lot of boxes for me. He's so articulate. Um, you get the motivational aspect of the life that he's led um, and, and, you know, just how inspiring he can be in telling his stories and wanting to know, okay, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, and an incredible sense of humor. And what one of the best elements of all of that is you and I now are off the hook here in episode nine with a throat punch because we're, no way we can do no chance. the throat punch better than Bill Clement just did it. That that was outstanding. That that story about <laughs> about Killer Hanson leaning over to the trainer during the game and mimicking a throat punch to Bill <laughs> is is phenomenal. Um, you, the one thing, you know, I mentioned it in the interview with Billy there is that nothing was a problem for him, even when it was a problem. Like, you know, we get stuff as happens in live TV, you get something doesn't work or something gets dumped on your plate and he'd be like, okay, let's figure it out. But, and he'd come up with a plan and we, you'd talk about it and he's smart, he's creative, um, and now, and now at 70 years old, by the way, he looks fantastic. Yeah. And he's living the life that he wants to live, but it, it has not been a career of ease. No. You know, like he talks about his personal and financial bankruptcy and having to, you know, he lost his marriage and had to basically rebuild his life at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a lot of admiration for, for what Bill has done. And I loved working with him. He was, you talk to the guys in Philly that have spent years with him, you know, um, Jim Jackson and Keith Jones. And yeah. they'll say, oh, Billy, man, he's got a story for everything. And he does it with enthusiasm. He was an awesome guest. And I was really happy to see him again. Yeah, I was fun. And, and you know, as we, as we kind of do the recap here, uh, I'm remembering a broadcast gathering, a meeting in, I think it was in Quebec. I did them in Montreal years and years ago, and they used to do those things. And the broadcast media would convene, and the National Hockey League would give some seminars and whatnot. And Bill Clement was a guest speaker, and he wasn't, he didn't stand at a podium, right? He, there was a stage up front. There's probably 150 media people there, broadcasters there. And he had like a wireless microphone, and he walked all the way across the front of that stage down the aisle his mannerisms, and, and he was just talking about not just his own life, but, you know, how to approach the hurdles in your own life and meet the challenges head on and embrace the adversity and all of that. And I, I'm a young broadcaster. We're probably going back maybe close to 20 years ago. And I left that seminar and it was my one takeaway from, from that entire weekend. And I mean, look, the commissioner spoke, there were all sorts of of, of big name hockey guys there, but it was that 45 minute seminar and, and guest speaking experience with Bill Clement that I remember vividly about that. So it's good to have the good guys on the Ray and Dregs podcast. There he is, our good friend Chris Abbott from CoolBet.co. Uh, how much sleep did you get after the Super Bowl? Because I, look, at I, Ray and I broke a promise. We said the last time we had you on pre-Super Bowl that we we're going to put a few bucks down on certain things uh, because we listen to what you say. We pay attention to the tips that you provide here on the podcast. But full disclosure, we didn't do that, which is probably it's a good, good thing, thing, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, we talked about it coming up to the Super Bowl. You know, it is the Brady factor, all of those things. But from a pure dollar perspective, what happened on Sunday? Because Kansas City was heavily favored, right, going in. So Kansas City was definitely the, the public favorite. Um, so for us, what we saw was, you know, an overwhelming majority of tickets were on 
Kansas City to win and then Kansas City to cover the three-point spread. But the bigger bets were coming in on Tampa Bay all week. And that's why the line never really moved. So at the end of the day, uh, Cool Bet actually needed Kansas City to win the game uh, for uh, from a profit perspective. But uh, I mean, with all the we had like 650 props available. So, I mean, you know, the book did okay. But um, yeah, it was it was a really interesting game when it came to betting because a lot of the heavy money came in on Tampa Bay to win and cover. And uh, of course that's what happened to relatively sweat free for a lot of Tampa Bay gamblers. So you said 650 props. Yeah. 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 How how could, Um, okay. So give me one that you looked at. If you can think of one off top where you went, ha, that's kind of funny or that's, well, there was one, I think it was like uh, the number of games played in Milos Raonic's uh, first match at the Australian Open uh, would be uh, more or less than the number of pass attempts or something like that. Like it was, it was right. just like all these cross sport props and things like that. So it's really interesting, but, but that's how you get sucked in because you really don't know. Yeah, it was, it was like, yeah, the total number of games played in the, in the tennis match so it was around 20. So whatever that was, like the, the total points scored by Tampa Bay or something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. So now what, now what, uh, what's next? Like where does Super Bowl ends? It's a huge, maybe the biggest betting day of the year. And then what? Well, uh, there was a lot of sleep on Monday for everybody involved. Yeah. And then uh, now we're actually turning our attention to the Scotties. Um, the, the curling community absolutely loves to bet. So um, while it's not as popular, well, yeah, well, it's not as popular in, in you know, um, when it comes to like uh, American gamblers, obviously, Canadians love to sit home and watch the coverage and, and bet on curling. It's an absolutely perfect game for that. So the Scotties and the Briar are coming up and then, uh, you know, we'll get into March Madness, hopefully. And then after that, you're into the NHL and NBA playoffs and the Masters and, and the French Open and Wimbledon. So it never stops. And of course, they're, you know, they're looking to play the Euro uh, soccer tournament this summer. So that'll be absolutely huge as well. Hopefully that goes ahead. So what are we betting? So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as you're talking about curling and all of my family is from Western Canada. My 81 year old mother, you know, sits on her couch, watches sports all day. That's that's what she does. And God help me if something interrupts a curling telecast. Right. Because. Yeah. She's not calling her cable provider. She's calling her son, Darren, why are they doing this? What is happening? So I'm going to put a little bit of cash down. I say this and I probably won't, but I'll try to. In my mom's uh, honor, what are we betting at when we're we're betting on when we're betting on curling? Like, are we just talking about outcomes here? We'll have uh, we'll definitely have a market on you know the the winner of the tournament that you'll be able to bet before the tournament. So you know you got your Jennifer Joneses and your Rachel Holmans will be among the favorites. You would have to think, and then yeah. uh, at each and every game. So obviously we know with these tournaments sometimes there's there's big mismatches as well. So there'll be a spread in points. So you know will will Jennifer Jones's team beat you know none of it by plus or minus eight points right so we'll have a spread on the curling games the total number of points in a curling game yeah and uh we we, we did it for the first time last year with the scotties and the briar and yeah. people absolutely love it and, and one of the one of our partners is the uh john epping team and they'll represent ontario at the yeah, briar right. uh, as they did last year so um yeah we, we've got a real good in with the curling community and and we certainly have a lot of fun and as you guys know curlers golfers rugby folks they uh they love to to have a good time so they party uh, hard yeah. man they party yeah. hard yeah and they like to get their money down so it's it's fun anything on austin matthews and his goal streak i mean can i put a few bucks down on the fact that he's gonna he's gonna score a nine straight ten straight twelve <laughs> you can bet on to score every night if you want but uh yeah it's getting to the point now where you know most times goal scorers are plus money uh, austin matthews it, it's it's like odds on that he will score so like better than 50 50 i mean that that's saying something in a in a hockey game, right? Like even some of the most prolific guys are usually at least plus one thirty, plus one forty. Um, but I mean, you know, those guys are playing so much, and he's yeah. getting so many looks, and, and he looks great. And listen, I've been the biggest Leafs naysayer for a long time. They last won the Stanley Cup when my dad was fifteen, but um, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm, fa- I'm falling for it again. I'm falling for it again. 
Hey, any way we can bet on, now we'd have to do some geographical research here, but I'm betting that Ferraro Drive in Brandon, Manitoba oh, is in fact it. the shortest street in Canada. I don't know if you saw that or not, but they did a <clears> segment <throat> last night. It's now online. You'll have to trick it, uh, check it out, Chris. <laughs> but, but Landon believes it's the shortest street. And, and Sarah Orleski and the crack crew on the Jets broadcast actually did the research. It's at least the shortest street in Brandon. Is that right, Ray? <laughs> no, it's, a, it's the shortest street in the new subdivision, which hasn't been plowed through yet, which <laughs> I believe will become one of the nicest areas of this subdivision. <laughs> um, I, I, think you, uh, I, I think you've misinterpreted the information, Darren. Okay, I apologize. I apologize. Well, I, t- I tell you what, I think, I think when it, if, it's a, if it is a shorter street, then it's, it's certainly more sought after, right? And real estate will only go up. See? There's only that's, so much square footage. Like, I like it. Who doesn't want to live on Ferraro Drive? Like, come on. Well, I tell you, I grew. You, you know, I, it'd be interesting to find out. I grew up in in uh, just outside of St. John's, Newfoundland, and of course, you know Newfoundlanders and their humor. There's a street in St. John's called Long Street, and it's <laughs> it can't be more than thirty feet long. That's so, uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to get the get the, the measuring tape out and see who wins. You know what, Ray? I built my first house. Holly Drager and I built our first house on McVicker Crescent in Brandon, Manitoba. Beautiful. Really? Yeah. Right by the river. Down by the river. That's where it was. <laughs> All right, Chris Abbott. Thanks, buddy. We'll hook All right. Up thanks, soon. guys. Ask Grain Dregs anything. I don't know why I, I say it that way. You know, James Duthie will, he'll open up a segment on Leaf Games with you, Ray, where it's, what's bugging Ray? And he'll, what's bugging Ray? Yeah. What's bugging? Yeah. And it annoys me. I'm sitting on the panel on the desk with him, and I'm looking at him going, this isn't about you, Duthie. This is about what's bugging Ray. Why are you singing the intro? But I just Because he knows it aggravates us. That's why. Uh, and okay, that's well, what you just did. You're, I, you're I, becoming Duthie. I Oh, jeez. Well, I, I apologize. I'm never singing Ask Brain Drag anything <laughs> intro again. Uh, but you can fire your questions to us on Twitter and Instagram at Rain Dregs or on our website, raindregs.com. Here's a good question from Chuck, because it's in the moment, right? It's kind of low-hanging fruit clickbait, but we, we, we subscribe to that here on the Rain Sure, Dregs sure. Podcast. Chuck wants to know who wins a seven-game series between the Leafs and the Habs right now. And he says, I think it goes the distance, but in the end, you got to give the Habs the nod because of their goaltending and Carey Price and Jake Allen. Price is better on a bad day than any Leaf goalie, Freddie Anderson, on his best day. I don't know if you agree with that assessment, but in a best of seven right now, who wins between the Leafs and the Habs? Well, first of all, I'll disagree with the segment. If you look at the goaltending statistics, um, uh, Jake Allen has been by far the better goaltender uh, uh, almost a full goal per game lower than Carey Price. His save percentage is, uh, I think, 0.17 better than Price at this moment. Like, a significant difference. And Anderson's been pretty good. So I yeah. can't even begin to to buy that comment. Um, I think Montreal wins because I uh, this, this would be crazy. Toronto's got a, a, a better top end. Yeah. Right? They got a better top end than most teams. But the bottom three quarters of... Montreal's roster is better than Toronto's and in a seven game series I think that the the grind the cumulative effect uh I I would I would pick Montreal but honestly if you're going to seven games Drake's you're almost at a coin flip by the time you get there yeah all right Rob Gray submitted this and it's it's a combination of fans multiple fans Rob says uh, asking, is the refing especially poor this season? Sure seems that way. Um, and the difference from period to period, game to game, and calls of what is and what isn't a penalty seems to be all over the map. Why can't it be more consistent? And how would you fix it? Well, I, I mean, the league officials officiate the game the way they're instructed to officiate it. Right, they're not all wild cards, or else right. you would just ref the game however you want. The standard is set from the NHL. They clearly want 
a focus on these little slashes and taps onto the hands. Um, yet I think there's a portion of the game where if an official's called four of these things, he's like, man, they're, they're all the same and they're not significant. And yeah. so I think that that comes into like the human nature of officiating and the ups and downs of, uh, of the, what we would like to see in a consistent game. I, I think it's probably the same for most sports. Um, you know, I, the, I'm sure Kansas city chiefs fans went, man, are they calling another holding penalty on our team? <laughs> because that's about 31 today. That's what it felt like. And I'm sure that's what it feels like to watch the games. I, I, you know, I'm frustrated, I guess, with the, you know, the, the areas of the game that are allowed to, to play out and, uh, and some that are not, you know, I'd like yeah. to see more consistency across the board. Okay. Final question from Nick Ray. Are you ready for this? Uh, this I don't is know. A, this is a big picture. This is a Bob McKenzie, big picture type of. So question. I'm just going to chime on the big picture here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. You just have to big picture in here. Yeah. Overarching is what it is. Uh, if you were NHL commissioner for a day and could change anything in the rule book, what would you change first to make the game better? Hmm. What would I change? Well, I got a couple of things I would change first. Go ahead. Okay. So I would take the rule book and I would put it in a boardroom and I would have two current officials, like two current referees, two current linesmen, two retired referees, two retired linesmen, recently retired. Mm -hmm. I would have a player's board of four to six players, and I would have uh, management representatives, two or three. And I would say, start at page one and go through this thing until we can come to general agreement on most of the rule book. And then we're going to call the rule book. Because I think now as... Dregs, you've opened the rule book too. It's like there's a the offside rule and there's 14 addendums under the offside yeah, rule. Yeah. I don't think anybody knows what the hell the rule is anymore. They do, but I think you can clarify that rule book and it will help the standard and the consistency of the rules. The second thing I, I would do, and this will be a little uh, counterintuitive maybe to, to a lot of people, with no red line, there's portions of the game that go really fast and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. It's like an air hockey game. The puck just gets slapped up, tipped into the other zone. They get it. They slap it up, tip it into the other zone. It just goes bing, 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 bing. Nothing happens. So I would put a line across the top of the, of the face-off circle. Scotty Bowman has, has talked about this a great number of years ago. Yeah. A two-line pass would come back into the game, but it would be from the defensive side of the top of the circles to the other side of the red line. And the reason that would improve the game, in my opinion, it would slow it down just a titch. Hmm. You would have more passing and two-on-one give-and-go plays instead of this long pass tip and chase it like a, like a golden retriever. And it would force the defense to come up to the red line. Because right now, the defense on that long pass, they just wait back there and they go get it. If they have to come and defend the red line, which they will, because if you don't defend the red line, then the other guys are coming at you with possession, with full speed. So they're going to come up. That's going to allow some two-on-ones up in the neutral zone. I think in a counterintuitive way, that opens up the game. I, I, I think it would be very beneficial. I, I don't disagree. And, and look, th there'll be some will say, oh, the players, you know, it'll take too long to adapt and all that. What would it take? A game, maybe two exhibition games before everybody goes... I got it. We're good. Well, yeah, because the first game, some guy's going to think he's wide open. He's going to get a pass. It's going to be a two line pass. He's going to go, Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And then he'll figure it out because those are the rules. And in my mind, just by slowing the game down just a bit, it's going to open the game up. But can you imagine if to, you know, I'm thinking as I'm talking here, people say, Oh, well then you're taking away one of Connor McDavid's greatest weapons. No, the defense still has to come up to the red line to defend it. Can you imagine if Connor catches some guy Ooh. half flat footed? Oh, Sayonara, gone. gone. And yeah. so I, I think it's something that they probably won't look at, but should. Awesome. Ask Rain Driggs anything. As we wrap up episode nine, a huge shout out to our partners who make the podcast possible. That's coolbet.co. 
the free-to-play sports and casino games website, Legaro.com Jewelers. Valentine's Day, I mean, there'll be people listening to this podcast, and they'll go, oh, I forgot, February 14th. Yeah, it's the 15th. Legaro, get on it. Legaro, do not let that be you, right? Look, we're – Valentine's Day will be gone before we re- uh, record episode 10. So you got some online shopping to do. And and you might even get more than 10% off because, hmm. you know, you, you use the Ray 10 and you get 10% sure. off. That's for schmoes like me. But you're actually Ray Ferraro. So if you log on to LagaroJewelers.com and say this is the one and only Ray Ferraro, Okay. I bet you I bet you might get 15% off. I could say, hey, I've got a street in Brandon named after me. It's not a long one. <laughs> What's your week look like, buddy? Uh, Jets game tomorrow. Um, got uh, my regular radio assignments um, oh. to do. And uh, then next week I get into, I got a couple of Leaf games and like a busier week. So kind of kind of around the house, try to be prepared for Valentine's day, which I'm going to try and sell on Cammy that, Hey, we're not getting any, anything for each other. Are we this year? And she's going to go, she's going to look at me like, nah, you know, so I got to get to work. Yeah. See, and again, this is just another shameless Legaro plug. Um, Cause I, I'm not a big Valentine's day guy. Neither is Holly. She doesn't, but it's one thing if you're purchasing something that matters, you know, you get the nice jewelry, earrings ring whatever okay that's going to stay with cammy for the rest of her life right you go out and buy a six dollar card and it's like it goes in the recycling bin in three days after you don't you don't keep your cards no who keeps their cards i do what for i don't know they're they're in an envelope they're in my little storage thing over there no hold on hold on because i've been around you long enough and I've been in healthier times, out for dinner, all of these things. Do you think Cammy would notice if you recycled her card every five years? No. Oh, if I gave her the same card. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's, I might try and uh, I, I, I have to find one of the ones that I got a question for you. Yes, we're live. If I recycled <laughs> a Valentine's Day card from five years ago, would you notice? Probably not. I think I'm going go, to do my shopping. <laughs> <laughs> it's, how impressed would Cammy be if you brought the crayons out? You actually did a homemade card. Well, I'm hoping the boys will do something homemade-ish. <laughs> I, I should probably put a little effort in. She the deserves much more than that. Are you going to rose petals up the stairs into the bedroom, onto the bed, bottle of champagne? If oh, I did I'll, that, I'll, she'd have she'd have the Dyson out and she'd be <laughs> vacuuming on the wall. What's this mess? What are you doing? So, yeah, you would not be able to live with that. You'd be looking over your shoulder. Oh, I can't stand that. Look at it. It's <laughs> messy. I got to clean that. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks for doing uh Yeah, you have a great week, always. Grace. Thanks for everybody. Week. Yeah, thanks to everybody for listening, rating, sharing, doing all that you do. And we're looking forward to episode 10. Have a good week.